Number one. This happened a couple of months ago in February. I'm in Northern Jersey, USA, so it gets cold, especially at night. I live on 10 plus acres of land and a popular trail that goes through the entire northern part of state, which goes along my property. We can't see the trail from our house, and the trail can't see our house. That all being said, it's very private where my house is. I'm a 21 year old female. I work overnight, so I come home when everyone else is leaving for work, and I'm home alone until about 6 or 7 at night. With the winter, it gets dark at around 5 5 30. So, one evening, I was walking to my kitchen, and as usual, I was walking through the house and I look out to the fields. The side of my house that was facing the fields were all big windows and sliding doors, pretty much a glass house. Anyway, I look out, and less than a quarter of a mile, I see a man walking from one side of our property towards the trail. He wasn't really walking, more like hunched over and skipping. I don't know what he was doing. Thanks to having livestock, we have binoculars handy to check on them, so I grab them to look at the guy. When I get focused on him, he looks directly at me while still walking. I'm looking at him, he's staring back with a creepy fucking grin, and we look at each other until he climbs through the woods and gets to the trail. We no longer see each other. I call my dad, he says it may have been a coincidence and he may have truly just wanted to get to the trail. I brush it off and get some more sleep until work. The next day, at the same time, I see the man again. This time, I'm not smack dab in the middle of a huge window. I'm hidden with binoculars and I focus on him again. I jump back. He's fucking staring right into the binoculars. How the hell did he know where I was? I call my dad. He didn't answer. Everything is locked. You're fine. He's on the trail now. I told myself. It's now 5pm. Between the snow on the ground and the clear sky with the sun about to fall, it's still bright in the fields. I walk towards the kitchen. And then I see the man. He's not walking. He's still standing, staring at me, closer to the house than before. I'm freaking out and I'm pissed because I couldn't get a thought into my head as to what he was doing cutting through private property. And even now, to just stand there, staring. I can see the grin on his face, without the binoculars. That's how close he was. I picked up my phone, showed it to him, and I dialed 911. He's still standing there. I explain everything to the dispatcher. He's still standing there. Around here, it could easily take a cop or two to get here in an hour. Lucky for me, it took 15 minutes. The man, still standing, staring. I then pointed at the cops coming down the driveway. The man, still standing, turns his head to look at them, turns it back to me, smiles wider, then fucking bolts towards me, smiling like a fucking crazy person still. Not a genuine smile though, it was a forced fake smile with just his mouth, if you can picture that. I ran towards the front door and out to the cop cars. They bolt out of their cars, one into my house and two around each side of the house. They caught him and then arrested him. They said when they found him, he was pressed up against the opposite side of the window I was originally standing at, still smiling. I don't know what came of him, but I know I won't be seeing him again. Crazy fucking standing man. Don't ever come on my property again. Here are the pictures of my property and the window I was standing in front of. Keep in mind, it was winter at the time. Nothing on the patio, and all the trees and shrubs were dead, so there was a clear lookout. Number 2 This isn't my encounter, but my mother's experience from when she was around 19 to 21 years old. 
my mother was almost a victim of a creepy rapist serial killer, Baby Man, who preferably used axes as a signature weapon. A bit of background information. My mother lived alone in a small unit in Richmond, Melbourne, and worked night shifts at a restaurant. Because she worked nights, she would sleep during the day and wake up at around 2 to 3 p.m. She had a friend who visited her place regularly at around the same time she woke up. And they would eat a meal together and hang out for a couple of hours. This was a part of my mum's daily routine. Now, one night, my mum was at the laundromat alone, and she noticed a smallish young European or Middle Eastern macho-looking man unloading a washing machine full of baby clothes. Like, a huge amount of baby clothes. To my mum, the whole scene looked out of place. The guy didn't seem right, his demeanour didn't fit the load of baby clothing he was hauling into his basket. The man looked over at my mum, stared at her, but my mum mentioned that she didn't think much about it at the time. She left shortly after with her load and drove back to her unit. A couple of weeks later, my mum finished her shift at work and drove back to her place, went to bed, woke up the next day in the afternoon, and soon heard a knock at her front door. Assuming it was her friend, she started walking down the hallway where she could see a frosted window at the end. She saw a smallish figure, the exact size as her friend, and didn't have any thought that it could be someone other than who she expected. My mum said that when she was halfway down the hallway, her body suddenly stopped in its tracks and an immediate overwhelming feeling of crippling fear came over her. She was frozen and staring at the shape of the figure outside for a minute when an unknown voice said something like, Hey, come, open the door, it's me. My mum slowly walked back down the hallway and into her bedroom. She waited in her room for the unknown visitor to leave, but he didn't. Every couple of minutes he would say something like, Come on, let me in. I know you're in there. Why don't you open the door? According to my mum, she waited in her room for two hours listening to the stranger calling out to her. She couldn't call anyone because the phone was in her kitchen and she didn't have the bravery to leave her room as the unit was tiny and easily accessible. She was afraid the person outside would hear her and find a way to get inside. She mentioned that after waiting for so long, she couldn't handle the cold temperature of her room as she was barely wearing anything. Note, she had only been sleeping beforehand. She finally got the guts to jump up and bolt from her room to the kitchen which had a back door. She ran out the back door and down the streets behind her unit. She had a neighbour who she was friends with and went straight to their place. She explained what had happened and they both looked out of this person's window which had a view of my mum's unit since their street was in a U-shape. They could see the stranger still standing at the front of my mum's door. It was the same man from the laundromat a few weeks earlier. They called the police, but the man left before anyone came. After the incident, my mum stayed at her parents' house for a few days. Soon, she felt that she was safe to go and live in her own unit again. A couple of weeks after moving back to her unit, she begins receiving notes and letters under her bed and on her front steps. According to my mum, the letters had strange things written on them. She never told me what was written, but she mentioned that the sentences were extremely amateur, as if written by a six-year-old. Letters were squiggly, written back to front, and arranged in strange sequences. My mum would give the notes into the police station. They weren't treated as much of a threat. This continued for maybe a few weeks or a month. One day, my mum woke up in the afternoon after a previous night shift. It was just another regular day, but she felt that she needed to go and spend a night at her parents' house. She left, spent the night, and got a call the next day to find that the strange man from the first incident had apparently returned to her unit around the same time she left. He then made his way to the back of her unit with an axe, and immediately started axing down her back door like a madman. He was seen by a neighbour who called the police. However, the man left before the police came. It turns out that the man's description, partnered with the strange notes my mum was receiving, 
fit the police's belief that the man was a suspect of the rape and murder of a number of girls in Melbourne from the 70s onwards. He wasn't caught, and I don't know if he ever was. He's most likely still out there. Number 3 When I was younger, I lived on a state of houses that backed onto a huge field where many people walked their dogs. It was even used as a cut through to the next neighborhood, which would take approximately 25 minutes to walk through. When I was about 13, my neighbor and I decided to camp out for the night in my back garden, which apart from a six foot wooden fence was completely open to the field, albeit with 20 trees around the fence. Seeing as we were into action man figures at the time, we decided we would make the tent to hide out, so we get together some branches and one of those army nets to put over the tent to make it a bit stealthier. We also put the tent in the corner of the back garden which had a small roof over it, which made it very dark once the sun went down. We did the usual thing, I ate lots of crisps and sweets before we decided to try and get some sleep in our well hidden super dark tent. Around 4am, I woke up to the sound of someone landing, and then walking on small stones. I then realised it was at the fence my mum and dad decorated with some gravel and flower pots. At first, I thought it was our cat, but it was far too loud to be such a small animal. I slowly sat up, trying not to make too much noise from my sleeping bag. Then, I heard it again. I once again tried to make my way to the front of the tent silently and looked through the zipper about 10 feet away from us. There were two guys dressed all in black crouching under the windowsill of the kitchen talking to each other. I immediately froze and had no idea what to do. They proceeded to creep closer to us looking for more windows or maybe an entrance. Because we were in the corner of the garden we were quite close to the path that led down to the side of our house where there was a door into the adjoining garage. I heard them talking quite clearly as now they were less than five feet away from me and my friend who was still asleep. They were talking about being unseen and just taking whatever they could find in the garage instead of breaking into the house and disturbing anyone. I had no idea what to do, so I rang the house phone which was pretty loud and waited for someone to answer. As soon as the phone rang, the two people bolted to the fence and hopped over. My dad then answered, and I whispered for him to get outside ASAP with a bat or something. Nothing happened in the end, but I am glad my friend slept silently. Number 4 In 1975, my dad was 11 years old and living in Leeds, England with his mother and stepfather. And for some pocket money, he would do a paper round every morning, extremely early. He left the house in the dark, as usual, and went to collect the papers, setting off to take his usual route through some playing fields, essentially a public park, but not a very well kept one. But this morning was a particularly dark and gloomy one, and as he approached the cut through he usually took, there seemed to be something off about it, so much so that it genuinely freaked him out just to be there. He decided to take his time and go the long way around just to avoid the park and thought nothing of it for the rest of the morning. When he got to school after his paper round, everyone was freaked out and in a quiet state. And upon asking his friends what was going on, they told him that a woman had been murdered with a hammer and stabbed in the neck earlier that morning in the same playing fields that he decided not to go through and on the same pathway too. Probably just a major coincidence, but a very lucky one at that, because the time he was on his round was the apparent time the crime was happening. This turned out to be the first of 13 gruesome murders committed by the notorious Peter Sutcliffe, aka the Yorkshire Ripper. Number 5 This happened around March 2008. I had recently split from my crazy ex, Bob, with whom I had children. I was living in my own apartment, and Bob had moved to the next town, and life was good. I was pretty jumpy when it came to people knocking on my door, as it usually meant Bob was drunk, on drugs, 
and convinced I had a man at my house doing god knows what in front of his kids and was in a mission to kill his manifested man. So yeah, that crazy. I lived in a very small Texas town of about 2200 people, almost no crime to speak of and people don't lock their doors. I figured with him being in the next town I didn't have to worry and so was a bit more lax about locking my door. On this night, I worked late and didn't end up going to bed till about 1am. As it happened, the foot of my bed was about 3 feet from the front door. I had a day bed that looked like a couch, so it wouldn't be so obvious that my bedroom was also my living room. I was all toasty and comfortable, then I remembered I didn't lock the door. Of course, I'm way too comfy to get up. I'd just fallen asleep when I heard rustling outside the door. I froze until I heard my screen door open and the doorknob being turned. I bolted up just in time to slam and deadbolt the door and assuming it was Bob yelled, Go away. He said, It's Daniel. I'm looking for Bob. I explained that I didn't know anyone named Daniel and that Bob doesn't live here anymore. He kept on insisting that I did know him and that he'd met me at my dad's. This was even more alarming since my dad lived eight hours away and nobody in that town knew him. He said he needed to talk to me, changing to his story to basically wanting to offer me comfort. Throughout this, he's still knocking and trying the doorknob. I pretended to cry and talk about my messy breakup to divert him from trying another way in. I got the phone, put it on pulse so the keys wouldn't make noise and dialed 911. I quietly told the operator what was happening and held the phone to the door so she could hear this guy once again banging on my door, trying to coax me into letting him in. The operator says someone is on their way so I hang up and call my father-in-law. He shows up before the cops with my brother-in-law and confront the guy. I felt safe enough to open the door and was hoping I might see this guy get his ass kicked. Right then, the cop strolls over and asks what the problem is. This is when the guy walks away fast. He says, Thanks for calling the cops. The cop watches him walk away and announces he wouldn't be able to catch up with him. The cop says he's just a nuisance and he does this to people from time to time. The best I could do was get a no trespassing order, which means little more than a piece of paper handed to you by a cop. As it turns out, I had met the guy once three years previous at my mum and stepdad's house. He was dating my friend and she brought him over as a double date movie night. He seemed a little slow and actually made a touchy feely pass at my BF. My boyfriend broke things off shortly after because he was becoming really creepy and I didn't see him again so I completely forgot he existed. Very faint silver lining to crazy ex Bob. He saw Daniel shortly after punched him in the face a couple of times and told him exactly what he would do to him if he ever came near me or my kids again. I saw him around sometimes and was as vile as I could be, refusing to wait on him at the convenience store I worked at and made sure everyone knew why. He would just roll his eyes like he thought I was joking. He ended up going to jail for statutory rape of his girlfriend's 12 year old daughter and gave them both syphilis. To be honest, I think he was probably intellectually slow already and drugs just amplified the crazy. I don't know how he knew where I lived, but I couldn't stop shaking at the thought of what would have happened if I didn't happen to have such an unconventional sleeping situation. I got very lucky and I always make sure the doors are locked before I go to bed. I'd like to also stress the importance of keeping your wits about you in situations like this. Sometimes that's your only defense. Hey guys, it's the Grim Reader here. I hope you enjoyed listening through that. If you did, please slap a like. And if you haven't already, why not subscribe to be notified of future uploads? If you have a story you want me to narrate, please send it to my email in the description box. Once again, thanks a lot for listening.